We have Daryl Highland from Rapid7, and he's presenting his talk called Internet of Vulnerabilities. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you. So how's everyone doing? Doing good? All right. All right. Outstanding. Uh, so again, my name is Daryl Highland. I am the research lead for IoT technology at Rapid7. And uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy this presentation. And I'll be around you know, after the presentation and clear till Monday. So you know, kind of grab me and uh, we could grab a drink and have some discussions. I'm always open to uh, feedback, uh, stuff you're working on. And we could talk about stuff I'm working on uh, that hasn't been published yet, but not all the details. Uh, so uh, it's kind of fun, and, and this is generally a presentation on some of the work that I've done over uh, the last 12, 14 months or so. Uh, some, uh, some smaller items, kind of more of the junk hacking, but kind of looked at it from a, uh, you know, what kind of privacy issues maybe exist all the way up to uh, enterprise level technology. Uh, so it should be kind of fun. So. From a perspective of IoT research, uh, when I came over at uh, Rapid7 and took over the position as the research lead, one of the first questions I was asked was, now you're a research lead, what the hell is IoT? Uh, and, and I think you all realize, you know, trying to define a definition of what IoT is is very difficult. So instead of doing that approach, I kind of tried to hit the 80-20 type thing, but kind of frame it around how do we approach uh, looking at the security of IoT technology. And I kind of use this model here. It's made up of three general pieces. Uh, you know, we always have the, you know, the hardware aspect of IoT, which is we're, we're all into hacking the hardware. But the hardware is only one small piece of the over, pu overall puzzle. And some of the other pieces we often run into are mobile, the mobile application aspects that interface with this technology, the cloud services, cloud APIs. So the ultimate goal was, as a research lead and as I drive research and uh, IoT testing within Rapid7, was, well, let's approach this from an ecosystem, a full ecosystem of an IoT product. That way we can examine the impact of one aspect of that ecosystem on the other. What's the, what's the impact of hardware vulnerabilities to cloud information, cloud data, cloud APIs? What's the impact of mobile applications on the hardware or on the cloud APIs and vice versa across this. And that way, anytime I approach a technology, I look at the entire ecosystem, all the pieces. So in this talk, we're gonna, a lot of it's gonna be covered. It's gonna be some of the outlying pieces. It's not all gonna be hardware. We're gonna talk about web, web API vulnerability issues that are part of the product line. And we're gonna look at uh, mobile application vulnerabilities. Uh, generally the most common one that they seem to find on everyone, which is definitely wanna get it fixed. But let's kind of, uh, Coming out of that, we, we kind of build a methodology uh, for approaching IoT testing. And it covers these general areas, you know, functional evaluation all the way down to examining the radio RF. And the goal is to dive into each one of these in detail across that ecosystem. And if you do that, you're gonna get a more holistic view of the security of that technology, which makes it all that much easier to actually get the technology fixed which is what we're all about. We're not, it's not about vulnerabilities, it's about fixing the issues. So let's kind of move forward on this and start talking about some of the IoT hacking. So what we're gonna talk about today is uh, some vulnerability issues we found around automated uh, lighting solutions. We're gonna talk about uh, BLE trackling dongos. And actually, I think they're actually using one back here as part of the contest. Uh, it's actually, I believe, one of the Tracker, tracker R Bravos. So we'll be talking about that one specifically because it was like, had some serious problems, especially with the cloud APIs. Uh, we're gonna talk about telepresence robots. I don't know if you've ever seen those crazy freaking robots. It's like an iPad on a Segway. So we're gonna talk about issues discovered there. And then we're also gonna talk about a GPS panic button. Uh, and this one has a really interesting story around it. I think you guys will find uh, uh, maybe not funny, but at least entertaining. So let's kind of move forward. So looking at automated lighting solutions, and what we looked at was the Sylvania Osram uh, products, the Lightify products. And there's two pieces of the Lightify products. There is the home user modules, which we have one here kind of all gutted out. Uh, and there was the enterprise version. This is what's used in businesses, organizations that can use to manage lighting within a building. Uh, 
things we found, you know, the, the common unencrypted storage of information, uh, poor encryption in the communication, unauthenticated controls, uh, and embedded web bones. Remember, a lot of this technology, especially as you move into the enterprise stuff, all have web servers, and those web servers are wrought with issues. So let's go ahead and start off. We'll start off with, uh, starting out with, I manned up and set up the home Lightify system and started looking at the mobile applications. And the first thing I found was the WPA pre-shared keys uh, actually stored unencrypted on the device, whether it was an Android or IoT, it was stored unencrypted. The crazy thing is, is this didn't need to be stored there after the system was set up, but it continued to store it there. You could, you could log out, you could do whatever you wanted to do, reboot the device, and still this data was in there. And you know, how, how often do we lose our like phones? I, I guess if you're on iOS, it's a little more, a little more security built in that. But if you're on Android, oh, what's security, okay? So you know, think about it. This is a common vulnerability. I find this over and over and over on probably 80% of the products I look at. I'm finding user IDs, OAuth tokens, uh, pre-shared keys, all the information stored right there on the device, giving you the ability to do anything from taking over the device, taking over the home wireless, to actually taking over all the cloud APIs and controlling a person's entire home uh, in some cases. And this is definitely something we need to get fixed. So, so my goal is, is, if you're out there doing IoT research, look at this stuff, look at the mobile applications, try to identify this stuff and report it out there. I've already reported you know, a systemic issue across all the products. Now we need to get it fixed because this is insane. There's solutions to prevent this type of stuff. Moving from there, we started looking at uh, the home enterprise devices and how they have their username and passwords for the Wi-Fi. So these devices often when they fire up have a Wi-Fi solution that's actually available. You connect to it and it's often used to configure the device. So we start looking at that, those default for that particular device, their SSID and the WPA pre-shared keys that are associated with the configuration on these devices and go, well, how secure are these? So we jump over here on the, this is the home, this is the home product, okay, right here. And we can see it's eight characters, alphanumeric, or 10 characters, alphanumeric, upper, lower case. Not perfect, but in reality, not that bad. So I get the enterprise product and I start looking at it. Now the big thing with the enterprise product is it actually has ethernet on it. It has Wi-Fi, so you can get access to it to Wi-Fi. And then it can also integrate to your building or, or your internal Wi-Fi system. So it has multiple ways for communication and literally all of them can function at the same time based on how the device is configured. So when we started looking at the actual WPA pre-shared key on this device here, we noticed that it was only eight characters, but I, I couldn't you know, figure out, you know, is it alphanumeric, upper, lowercase, and all that type of stuff. So I had them send me a second device. Once I got the second device, the answer become clear. It's actually hex, A through F, zero through nine, eight characters only. So instantly we set this thing up like it was in an enterprise. We hooked it on the ethernet, it's Wi-Fi came up running. You could connect the management console into the Wi-Fi or the Ethernet, but if you're connected through the Wi-Fi, a typical WPA pre-shared key attack. You kick them off, they rejoin, you capture the data, and apparently I don't have that slide in there anymore, but uh, the crack was uh, using a really shitty GPU. Uh, we cracked that in uh, less, uh, right around two hours. So instantly, a device in an enterprise, not configured, not shutting that stuff off, which may be very common, using really bad pre-shared key, key space, we quickly crack this in two hours or less, giving an attacker to be able to gain access to an internal, res uh, internal network fairly quickie, quickly. So uh, also this device happened to have a, a web server. Uh, we found a couple vulnerabilities on there. So the first one was when I was logging onto the device, I'm going down through the list and I go, uh, security logs. I always like something when it says security logs. That's, that's always the greatest thing. So I go into the security logs and I notice it showed the username, and the username of my logon. So I came back out and tried logging on uh, with a bogus name, went back in the logs and it had that name in there. So I thought, oh, what the hell? Cross-site scripting, persistent in the security logs. So I gave it a little present of a laughing skull, so. So also on the web server, we found some issues 
in the configuration page, the management configuration page for the actual Wi-Fi setup. Uh, and, and I don't know, if you, when you're looking at a Wi-Fi configuration page and you see this page, what do you think? I, I often ask this, well, what's the first thing that goes through your head? The first thing that goes through my head, it's another injection point for actually injecting cross-site scripting into a management console on a system. But it's an out of band, which we often don't look at. Because we're, you know, don't people don't think an SSID can be built, the SSID name can be built to contain Java code. It can be configured to make calls out to a server and pull down Java code. So I have a quick video here. A little bit for entertainment. So I actually spoke at uh, Black Hat in 2013 and I presented a paper on uh, attacking embedded devices via SSIDs. I don't know how well it's e easy to see this, but... So we come over here and we go to the Waikai configuration and we quickly see that, uh, that we can actually see the Wi-Fi access points in close proximity. So we just basically set up our little own special SSID. Uh, which is always fun. So a soft, a, a soft access point, we fire it up, so we can check to see what does the application do uh, when it interacts with a, a Wi-Fi injection. So I've used, these, I've used this attack a number of times over the years. So something to consider when you're, you're engaged in this, don't always think about just cross-site scripting. Uh, if you go back and look at the paper I published here on this particular attack vector, we actually found format string attacks via this vector also. So there's a number of things you can carry out via SSIDs uh, against uh, embedded technologies that contain web services. So uh, a number of the one of the things, something to consider, anytime you're testing any kind of IoT technology, uh, you're used to testing it in all the normal conditions. Well, we also get to contest it in what's considered abnormal conditions. How does the equipment affect or act when it loses access to its cloud APIs? Often the technology, especially home automation, will go into a, a, local, a local control mode. Local control mode means there's going to be some kind of service exposed locally, giving the ability to connect to that device. Often that is not authenticated or encrypted data. And it was the same way in this case. It actually had port 4000 open. So we were able to capture all the communication and decode it and figure out how to control the device. Now I do have a demo here, and uh, I'm not sure how the whole Wi-Fi stuff's going to work in here, so it's liable to go to hell in a handbasket. But either way, we can talk through it if it fails. So a little bit of camera here. So we have a device right here. And I'm going to go ahead and plug that in. Let's see if we can get another. Let's see if we can double a couple screens up here. So this will be a little difficult, but uh, let me see if we can do this. So a couple interesting things you're going to see here. So you see the stuff in the background. I want you to be able to see the bulb, the thing start up. Okay. Oh, cannot. Okay. Let's fix that. Demo gods, man.
Either that or my device died. One of the two. Well, we'll give it one more try and then we'll start to verbalize and through it. Hopefully I didn't pump up the camera. Nope. Well, unfortunately, apparently my Shikra just died. Life's a bitch, ain't it? Let's see if this is the right one. Okay, so unfortunately we can't do that live. What I was hoping to do was show the one command, uh, actually being able to make the device jump from one access point to another access point with a command. So it was unauthenticated, but if you watch this screen, there's a couple other interesting things to point out. This is the UART connection on the device. So in this case, we don't get a full command shell, we get a small subset commands. But if you watch clearly, I'm hoping it'll come up, it may not. But you'll see, there it goes, don't miss it. Password, device key, product key. It's actually calling out to China. Uh, so it's going out to China and connecting up. Looking at the data and what was being transferred, my best determination, which was a good one, was that it was connecting out for validating firmwares. The particular company that produces the, the underlying hardware here actually uh, seems to be one of the better ones I've seen so far from the China perspective, and I couldn't determine it doing anything else, uh, and couldn't figure out if they were doing anything else. It all seemed to be purely uh, testing and validating firmwares. So if your firmware was out of date, then it would send commands back via uh, the APIs to communicate to you to be able to um, upgrade your systems. So it would flag your system and you start getting alerts to actually upgrade the firmware. Uh, and that was determined based on that information there. But you can see there's a couple subsets. You can identify various ports and stuff that are actually open on the device. So look at, looking at the hardware to be able to get access, I mean, anytime you open up a piece of hardware, if you're anything like me, the first thing you look for is where can I connect in to start looking at it. So, so we find these small pads, and these are uh, 0.1 millimeter pitch pads. Uh, and if you're an old man like me, trying to solder those are a total bitch. Um, so you can see how big the connector pins are. It's like, I can't even see that good. So we got them soldered in pretty good, and uh, like I tell everyone, I cheat. Uh, I use a microscope, uh, which works really good. Uh, and again, we could tap into those, so, so we step back here. Uh, this one happened to be, in this case right here, goes to the main uh, processor on the device and would give us the UART log dump, uh, as we were seeing there, so we could see what was going on. So you could do various things, like if uh, my uh, card hadn't failed on me for some reason, uh, you'd be able to actually see the device connect out to the internet, to the cloud, get the connection. You would also see how it handled the command, incoming command, unauthenticated over port 4000, and try to drop off that one and try to connect out to a third party or do a different access point for control. Uh, and there's the, the whole rig with the Shikra that apparently just died. I actually have a couple spares, but we'll, we'll see if time, time I can twice swap out. But we'll see, let's get through the presentation first and see if anyone has any questions, because I could easily show this to you offline. So the next one is a telepresence robot. And these things are truly freaky if you've ever seen them running around. Has anyone ever seen these running around in offices? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty wild, you know? 
So, so I met a uh, college pro professor at a university, and the first thing he asked me is, Daryl, have you ever seen these new telepresence robots? So he starts telling me about it, he says, well, I have one, but it wasn't the full one, he had the desktop version. Uh, so he let me play around with it online and see how it all worked. So I was talking to some people at Rapid7 and going, you know, it'd be really cool to look at these things. And someone goes, you know, we like have two or three of these in a Cambridge office. So instantly I start prodding people. And uh, they packed one up and shipped it to my house, which was totally cool. So I got to play with it, run it around the house. I wrecked it. First time I fired it up, it spun around, run across my office, it hit a wall and then wrecked. Luckily, I didn't destroy it. I'm thinking, oh, shit, I'm going to send this thing back in a paper bag. Uh, but luckily, I sent it back fully functional. So in the case here, we had a couple things. Uh, uh, the, point, the first point is I didn't cut it open, okay? I, I sat and spent like three hours trying to figure out how to disassemble this thing, and I couldn't figure out how to safely do it without pulling the rotating wheels on it to gain access to the locking bolts. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to do was basically send back in a paper bag a $3,500 product uh, that was actually being used by certain people in the company. So I didn't really focus on digging into the hardware and tearing it apart to see what I can get. But I did look at some other things. Uh, I looked at the cloud APIs, the communication. I looked at whether it handled Bluetooth pairing properly, those type of things. So the first thing, started looking at the API, man in the middle, the connectivity from the head to the, to the cloud and started looking at how this thing was communicating. And I instantly found out that the APIs had no freaking authentication to them. Several no authentication. So you take this URL right here and it has this offset. If I set the offset as some astronomical number, it would error message back to me and so that's invalid, the highest number is this. So, so the first thing I did was, you know, I threw that higher number in there and I didn't know what the limit was, so I set it at like two or 300, just curious to see what would come back, thinking it would be my data and my data only. No, it wasn't, it was all data. It was data for every robot that was functioning that day. This particular data here is live tracking data of session communication as it happens on the particular device. It's all recorded into a database. So instantly I step back, you know, there's a whole ethical issue at that point. I'm seeing other people's data. Step back, had the right legal conversations. We figured out how to appropriately narrow it down so I can only look at my data and try to focus on that because that's what we were after. We don't want other people's data. We want to be able to look at our data and consider the overall security of it. But if you set this offset at one and set the limit at a million, you would basically pull down all of the data for every robot since the thing was put into place for every robot on the face of the earth. And we get the session, this session data. The session data wouldn't give me the ability to take full control because there was two communication paths. One of them was encrypted and pinned properly. And I couldn't break the pinning. Uh, I don't know what they were doing weird, but I couldn't get in the middle. Uh, it kept failing and causing the robot to fail. And so that was the case. So looking at another API here, uh, very similar, that offset, you could set the number. This was for every registered robot out there. And it would return back installation key. But it also returned GPS coordinates, the name of the device. So literally, you could dump all the data, gain access, GPS coordinates for every robot that was issued in place functioning on the face of the earth. The third item that I started to look at was dealing with what's known as the robot key. This is the key to the kingdom. This one was a little more secure. Uh, you, had to, uh, you had to be able to be local enough to man in the middle of the device, okay? But it turned out that once you accomplished that, what the robot would do would send out a robot key information to the cloud, post it to the cloud. The cloud would return to you the username. Now, to start off with, to make the robot function, the only thing that had to be returned was the username, because it went into a menu system where you can say how many users and add more new users. So the only thing needed was the username to be returned. But when you put in the robot key, it returned driver tokens. Driver tokens are nothing but session tokens that are assigned to somebody forever. So that means they, they, if they load the application on their, their laptop, to be able to control the robot. 
they would connect out there. And when they logged in, this session token or driver token was used for them to remote control the robot. So when you put this thing out there, robot key to the cloud, no authentication, it will return all the users and all the robot control keys for every user. Basically meaning that you could become anybody. So, so what I did here was out of curiosity, you know, I'm like, okay, how can I mimic this? So if I did this, let's say I, I got the robot key, I go off over here, I post the robot key, it gives me the list, I put the application on my machine, I log on out there, create myself account, it would give me an account with no control of a robot, I would go into my session tokens, drop one of these in there, and all the robots would show up, at that point giving me full control of the robots. So yes, a seriously bad problem. Again, the customers were very receptive, or the vendor was very receptive to this, and we got these problems fixed quickly, now, which is always a plus. So the next one we want to look at is the BLE dongles. Now I looked at, I looked at like four or five of these, you know, the tile, this one, there's one called nut, uh, there was another one I was looking at at that time. And it was curious, uh, and this was driven very much by the fact that I was seeing these people carrying these around on their keychains all the time. Every time you turn around, it's like, oh, well, they had this weird dongle, whether it was a silver or a blue one or whatever the brand was, you know, and, and I started thinking, well, what kind of issues would be here? Obviously, I would consider more of a privacy issue. So it was like unauthenticated access was identified, uh, weak BLA pairing, uh, which is another common vulnerabilities we encounter, information leakage, and in insecure cloud APIs. So uh, what we want to do is I actually have one here. So my goal is let's see if we can look at this and, and see. I'm, I'm surprised no one's hacked me yet. So apparently they're not doing anything good back there on these. No devices. There's no devices because I plugged it in to plug this in. What's that? I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the purpose of the dongle uh, is to be able to find your keys when you lose them. Uh, and the interesting thing with these devices, they use this thing called crowd GPSing. And the way that works is when you purchase one of these things, and you set up the application on your phone, if you, lose, if you lose your device and you happen to lose it in the city park, how the hell you find it? Uh, the way you find it is you look on your phone and what it'll do is if anyone else running that application passes within proximity of this, it'll send the GPS data out to the cloud showing you where you actually lost your device, taking advantage of everybody using the same product. And that's how most of them work. Not sure how well this will work on this screen here, but we'll see. So, um, first thing I want to do is turn Bluetooth on, which may be a mistake. And so, we're going to see a shitload of stuff show up here. All the people that are either futzing with us or too stupid to turn their devices off. So the first thing I want to do is, so I have this device here, and we're going to jump over to another screen now that that's turned on. Now, I don't know if anyone's ever used NRF Connect. Why are you doing this? Been installed before. Shit. Was or was? I didn't see it. Ah, thank you. My hand was over top of it. So let's do a scan. And this is going to detect Bluetooth low energy, which is what this device is using. Let's flush this old data out of here. 
So we can see, uh, you can see all the people <laughs> at DEF CON that didn't bother to turn off Bluetooth low energy. And the shit list goes on and on and on. So let's see if my device shows up and see if I can find it in here. So this is the fear anytime you do these in large audiences. <laughs> Try again. So there's a tile. You can see the tile. That was that's one of mine. Okay, let's... Well, the demo gods are being a total bitch today. Because I don't even see the device back there. You got time. Uh, we're going to jump on to something else. Weston, you jump up here, change the battery out in this. There's some batteries right there in the top, and there's a little black hole. Yeah, it should be right there in the top, in the, in the, in the case there, there's batteries. So let's go ahead and move on from here, come back to that. Check to see if it's a battery issue. Um, so what, was, what I was gonna show, maybe we're gonna show it at the end. So basically when we fire this device up, uh, so you understand the risk, is we can actually uh, see the device out there, obviously with Bluetooth low energy. But in a crowd like this, I wouldn't know who was using that device. But if we look at the actual device, the device has uh, a couple things. It has a tracker ID. The tracker ID is the, comp uh, is the company identifier. It's like at four digit, zero, 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 whatever it is and the MAC address is backwards. So that's the device identifier on this particular device. Also, it doesn't have Bluetooth, uh, BLE uh, pairing properly. So I can pair with the device and set the alarm off remotely. So if you're in an audience and you identify someone using one of these tracker devices, uh, Bravo devices, you can set the alarm off and now you know who the person is because you look for that poor, poor souls trying not to look stupid uh, as they try to figure out why their damn dongle is buzzing. Uh, and making a loud noise. To go beyond that, we moved from there and started looking at the cloud APIs. And it turned out that if we go out to the cloud API unauthenticated and pass that identifier out there, we could get GPS coordinates of the user. So now, not only can I identify who's in the audience with one of those devices, I can proceed to track them at this point wherever they go. Uh, 
I don't know about you, but uh, to me that's, that's uh, somewhat of a serious issue. Now again, you know, I've had this conversation with uh, media and stuff like that. We also got to put some kind of true risk behind it. If, if, you're any, if you're most of us and you have this device, that risk would not be that big. Who wants to track me? Uh, and so it only becomes an issue is if you're somebody important, you know, you're a politician, you know, a movie star or something like that, then it probably would have been a really bad idea. Uh, or you have somebody that's a known, tra uh, a known stalker, then it becomes more of an issue. But in generally, it's, I don't consider it the most critical issue, but something that needs to be resolved. Uh, the vendor quickly resolved this issue right here. Uh, now you have to be authenticated uh, to be able to gain access to that. You can't read that particular data. I actually think in this case here, they took uh, that particular access to that API functionality out of the system, so it is no longer viewable. So you changed the battery on it? Okay. We'll look for it one more time. If it's not there, then there it is. So we can pair with the device. A lot of times these type of connectivities and communications get messed up just based on the amount of Wi-Fi it's in the air. So, I mean, it's still trying to pair with the device. So you go to a quiet room, this works every time. I'm surprised any of this technology works with as many devices that are out there with all the noise. So that's thinking about pairing with it. So we're going to actually move on. So uh, the next device, this is a panic button, okay? So the story goes, uh, actual Associated Press came to us and goes, the Colombian government, South America, has recommended that we purchase these for protection from being kidnapped. Okay? And we really wonder, is this a good solution? Is this a secure solution for moving forward? So, very interesting project. So it's like, let's go ahead and take a look at it and see what's there. I mean, we found a number of issues. Uh, literally just a poor design. Uh, non-SSL communication, some balance check problems within the functionality, uh, and some real-time web server failures. So let's look at this. Let's start with the first total failure of the product. I didn't even have to open it up, I just opened up the manual. So we opened up the manual and we found out this thing, the way this device works, it's configured and controlled via SMS messages. So you can set a password on this device, a pass pin number, that would add some level of security against the device from someone able to get your GPS coordinates and mess with the device, except for one command. There's one command, you do not have to have a passcode to gain access once it's configured. Guess which one? It's the reset command. Reset the device back to factory level. So basically, you press the button, it ain't calling nobody. And, I then can still send an SMS message to you because now there's no password and it's going to send back to me your GPS coordinates. Now if I'm in fear of being kidnapped, that just went the hell in a handbasket real quick. Uh, so that was a vulnerability before we even opened the device up. Uh, one other command they said didn't need a password was reboot. That was not true. Reboot would not work unless the passcode was actually put on the device. But we did find some use for a version of the reboot. Well, it turned out that uh, this particular command, reboot all capital explanation point, was uh, an undocumented command. We pulled the firmware off the device and I went through the firmware and that's where I found that out. The interesting thing with that was, it, well, anything, anytime you send an SMS message to this thing and there is a password set on it, you get no results back. So my theory was, is there any way to war dial this thing, war SMS message this thing? So we found out with the reboot, it would return a format error. So instantly, if I know all the reporters probably bought their phone from this location and they're in this city here, 
and I wanted to gain access to the device or figure out who had devices, how hard would it be just to basically send an SMS message to every one of the phones and then wait for the response back? And if I receive a format error response back, the odds are pretty high it's going to be one of these devices, giving us the ability to basically do kind of a ward dial type of tack on the device. Uh, moving from there, we also found some bounds check issues. Didn't find an effective way to uh, exploit these, but it was still something to make note of. It turns out when you set up a command, when you set up the phone numbers, there's three phone numbers you can set up in this device. And you use A and then the phone number, B and the phone number, and then C and the phone number. We found out that if you uh, actually put more characters than what's in the phone number, it would actually overwrite a segment of the configuration on the actual flash device. Now, I didn't do this to all of the commands. Uh, the first time I did this, I did it to one command and basically had to reboot the device like a dozen times and then sent a reset message to it to get it to even freaking work right properly after that. So I never did quite figure out what I overwrote, but apparently I overwrote something I shouldn't have. Uh, but as an example, you can see here, we send this command to set up the SMS message for the, or with SMS messages to set up the first phone number, and we end up overwriting the second one, B, and you see all the A's show up in B, showing they're able to overwrite that. Now there's a whole bunch of commands, and I went into the flash, and I mapped out the structure on the flash, trying to find out if there was a possible way to overwrite, overwrite some of the code, uh, and I didn't initially find that, so I don't think there was. Uh, it was getting pretty close to it in the flash to overwrite the actual firmware, but it didn't quite hit it. Uh, the other thing was, and this was the actual web services, and this was like totally bad. So um, without any authentication, you can actually punch in the user IDs, and this would ret return the, the phone's uh, EM, EMEI number, uh, which you could use later on to take over the device via the web application. So all you had to do is start at one and increment up over the 60, 70, 80,000 and basically gain access to all the identifier numbers for the actual uh, devices. Uh, another attack we we're actually able to do using that IMEI number is you could actually poison the GPS data online. So literally, uh, literally once you got that EMI number, you can make the device look like it was anywhere else on the face of the earth you want. So of course I did. Uh, so I live in Dayton, Ohio, and instantly my device decided it was gonna jump to Moscow. So we're actually able to poison it. And that would over, um, I'm trying to think of the port it would over, 2050 I think was the port that was actually open, completely open in the cloud, sent all the data you want to it. Uh, another potential attack point, you know, what happens if I decide to send a number that's 40,000 characters long. Uh, I did not own the web server, nor was I doing vulnerability testing for the web server. So at that case, I was only be able to focus on my particular data and the impact on my data. Uh, but again, you're able to actually gain uh, a level of access to that data, which I thought was pretty cool. So uh, let's check over here and see if the tracker device paired. And it did not. Okay, it says it's pairing now. Okay, that time it paired. Apparently it didn't like me clicking on it last time. No, wrong one. So we actually were able to pair with the device. Now let's see if we're lucky enough to actually find it out there in NRF Connect. Okay, here it is. Okay, so now we can see there's a number of services on this particular device. Uh, and we can come down here and based on the previous screen, or you can see it at the top, unfortunately you can't, you can see the identifier. So we'll drop back to the other screen. But from here, you can easily just jump on alert, go alert, 
select it to high alert. Let's see if this uh, demo fails like hell, Tim. I hope you could hear that, it's kind of high frequency. So you can see without any, uh, any level of authentication, we compare to the device that somebody's carrying and uh, we could do, generally what's taking place is a DOS. This battery ain't gonna last long with it uh, screaming like this. And I assure you the person's gonna be digging through their stuff. This room's a little noisy, but in most places, coffee shops, they're actually gonna notice this fairly quick. There, turn the alarm off. So let's come back here. Okay, if we come down here to this device, let me see. Ah, it's already there, don't do that. Okay, so we can quickly see in here, um, well, I can see, I'm not sure if you can, I was hoping to have bigger screens, but we can see the tracker ID here. So we have the four digits, 000, company identifier, and then we have this identifier here, uh, and this is the MAC address. So if you just reverse the MAC address, you have the tracker identifier. And it gave us the ability to, at that point, uh, once we've identified somebody with the device, to continue tracking them as long as they own that device. Uh, and at bare minimum, you're gonna be able to track them to their home if you wanna know where they're living. So uh, a serious breach of privacy, a potential serious brief of breach of privacy, uh, which I think is pretty serious. And I think this is closing in on the end of the presentation. There's my contact information. Please reach out to me. I'm always working on new stuff. I'm always looking for feedback, knowledge. You know, I think in this field, we're all kind of expanding and growing and learning new stuff. Um, I've been doing some really cool stuff lately. Uh, have some cool stuff coming out probably in the next couple months. I would say super great, but some interesting, again, similar findings. Uh, that really impact the overall security of some of these products. Uh, also, some RF stuff we're, we're messing with. Uh, and uh, been doing a lot of stuff with uh, uh, actually uh, data recovery off IoT devices um, from being able to go in and uh, pull, pull the right chips and the right equipment and reading chips and uh, doing some BGA and working on some BGA reballing techniques right now, which is kind of exciting. Because uh, every time I tear a, tear a device apart, the last thing I want to do is throw it in a dumpster. I want to rebuild it, and I'm, I'm, so far I'm pretty good at uh, taking a device completely apart, pulling the chip, pulling what I need, and putting the devices back into place. But that's kind of the stuff I'm working on, always looking for new ideas, uh, new friends. So uh, any questions? I guess not. Well, I'll be around. Please feel free to grab me if you have any questions, you want to talk. Uh, again, uh, thanks to the demo gods and my card dying on me.